Hello and welcome to Wrestling With Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multi-family real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now today we have Daniel Wood join us with, joining us. Hey Daniel, how are you doing, man? Hey, so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, my man. Uh, absolutely, man. I'm excited to have you here. Out of interest, you want to tell people where you currently are? Yeah, so I am, my dad's from the U.S., but I'm born and raised in Sweden, and we're talking about it, just to make things complicated, I invest in the U.K., actually in your home country, in Wales. <laughs> That's fascinating, this is gonna, you were telling me that, it's gonna be so, I'm so excited to dive into that, there's not many people I know that invest in Wales, so it's gonna be really interesting, <laughs> but um, before we jump into the conversation, um, do you want to give us an idea about your background, what you've been up to, and what you're currently up to these days? Yeah, no, absolutely. We started investing a few years back. I mean, I was in a corporate job and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd gone to, when I was 18, my bosses took me to an event with uh, Brian Tracy okay. and I learned about goal setting, right? I used to be in sports. I mean, I wasn't as athletic as you, but I played baseball <laughs> in Sweden. So we'll put that level there, but I played be baseball and I'd, I loved goals, but Brian talked about writing them down and getting that key focus on your goals. And the only thing I could come up with, I sat down with my wife. I said, all right, we're going to sit, we're going to set our goals. We're going to write them down. And the only thing that came to mind was retirement. <laughs> that was my one thought. And that's because I believe it's because my dad was 40 when I was born. So, you know, he was nearing retirement throughout my growing up and every day his, you know, first thing he said coming in through the door when he came home from work was, almost time to retire. <laughs> and so for me, that was my big goal. You know, I go to work to retire. So I set that goal and I had no idea how to achieve it. Right. So I started thinking, how could I somehow make, and my, I set a goal of making $5,000 a month passively. And I didn't even know the term passive income. Right. It was like, I, I just thought, well, maybe if I have, you know, a couple million in my bank account, I could probably get an interest that would allow me to quit. And it kind of set me on a discovery for the next, you know, seven or so years before um, when I was working in the recruitment industry, I met these two young entrepreneurs who uh, they, I learned they'd been on the fast track to becoming like CEOs of one of the top banks in Sweden. And they quit and started this little recruitment agency. And they brought me in as a consultant. And I, you know, when I heard, I'm like, you guys are crazy. Why? Why would you leave this amazing career to start your own business? It's idiotic. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and they kind of both laughed. They kind of said, well, look, have you read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? And I said, no, no, I haven't. They said, well, read it. If you still have that question, come back to us. And I said, well, fine. All right. So I bought the book. I started reading and I just couldn't put it down. You know, I was like, Wow. And uh, I, I, as you obviously know, and I'm sure most of the listeners who've probably read the book as well, is uh, he talks so much about real estate. And I got so excited to invest into real estate. And we started looking at the Swedish market. And what probably most Americans don't know is that Sweden is, well, in the US, you would probably, call, if you moved to Sweden, you'd probably call it a socialist or communist country, right? We are, it, it's a fantastic country, but it's very socialist. And the, the property industry is very heavily regulated. So it's very tough as a small entrepreneur. And we realized if you don't have, you know, maybe $5 million plus to invest, there's just no reason to get into the Swedish market. So we started looking around and uh, that's how we kind of ended up in, in your home country in, in the UK. Uh, we got a mentor uh, who was British and that was kind of the challenge because I know you, you mentioned that you invest in a different state from where you live. And it's just very different from investing in your own backyard, right? You know, my, my mentor literally invested down the road from where his office was. So he, when he started teaching us, he started teaching us about how to, you know, project manage. And his whole philosophy of project management was he would take his dog for a walk <laughs> by the properties he was refurbing, right? And he would see, are the builders there? And if they were not, he would send them a text and say, hey, are you on the way? And they would say, oh, yes, of course, we'll be there in 10 minutes. And I don't think he ever realized that if he didn't send that text, they wouldn't be there, yeah. right? 
And so he just said, well, builders are great. You know, you go by and they're working. And uh, well, we started out and, uh, you know, we, we were kind of the model students, right? We jumped both feet in full on hundred percent did, you know, we, I think we did like 12 deals in our first like six months. Well, it took three months to get deal number one. And then from there, six months, we did like 12 deals and most of them went totally sideways. You know, we got ripped off by builders. We got ripped off by partners. We got ripped off by agents. You know, everything went, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I even had a, a architect and, and a project manager start building a property. It was three, three floors, you know, where it was a terraced house, three floors that were converting into three flats. And they put the front door and hallway coming in through the bottom floor flat. I was like, no. And they didn't tell me what they did was they told me that, hey, great news. We were able to split the bottom floor into two flats. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. We just didn't know these details of how to follow up. But, but you know, we ended losing, a, we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, it took, you know, we were really blessed. We actually met Kim Kiyosaki herself. Uh, we had her come speak for us at an event here in Sweden. So we, we do an annual empowered women event. We had her come over and she actually became the mentor for my wife, not for me, obviously, uh, <laughs> but she helped us out turning our business around. We had other great mentors. Like I mentioned to you, I, my Welsh mentor, Derry Llewellyn Davies uh, helped me turn the business around and lots of other people came in and supported us. And we were able to, because you know, my accountant was saying, you got to go bankrupt, right? I'd brought, I didn't have three hundred thousand dollars. I I brought in investor capital, and you know, we'd lost all that money, and my accountant was just saying, time to go bankrupt, dude. You're you're done. It's over. And uh, I said, well, that sounds pretty nice. You know, get rid of the debt and start over. Um, but then we realized that meant we would be throwing our investors under the bus, and we just said, well, we can't do that, and that started this kind of slow slog of kind of doing new deals to compensate for the bad and try to slowly pay out these investors. And it's been a long process, but we finally have been able to turn the ship around, get everything going. And now we have a portfolio that's, uh, you know, it allows us to not have to work, <laughs> you know, we're, we're free. And, and I think when this happened, because we'd, you know, we did big events like with Kim and we'd, we've been, we've always been very transparent and vocal about our journey, about our setbacks. I mean, I, I always say, I don't have any skeletons in my closet. I have lessons we can learn from, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it turned out that when we, we did that turnaround and we started, you know, we could quit and, you know, I could post on Facebook, you know, final day of work kind of thing. Uh, people started reaching out and just saying like, yo, could you help me? Could you teach me to do this? And uh, my gut reaction was to say no. <laughs> yeah, I'd worked so hard to not get a job, right? I wanted to lie by my pool and have relax. Uh, but you know, it's hard to say no to someone who's asking for help, right? And so finally, we said, yeah, of course, we'll help out. And it turned out it was just so much fun, you know, helping someone, seeing them do their first property, get cash flow. And that's really what we do now. It's a big part. We have our own development company. We're, we're actually looking at doing our first deal in Sweden ironically, but uh, we do deals in the UK. We've just partnered with a crowdfunding platform. So we're now co-owners in a crowdfunding platform. So we finance deals now. Uh, but really what we're passionate about is now that we're helping international investors invest into the UK and getting these systems right, this, this cross-border systems to how to manage from afar. And it's been, it's been really cool. Our students in 2020, did uh, I don't have the exact number, but right around five million dollars worth of deals, uh, which was really really cool and really fun to see. And most of those being first time, uh, first time buyers of a of an investment property. Wow! <laughs> but I, so that I, was the long answer yeah, to your short I, question. No, that's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. I even I usually don't have to write questions down, but I want to make sure that I get to stuff that I because otherwise I'm sure there's other stuff that's going to come up. So I was, I've written some stuff down that I want to ask you because I want to get back to. But first of all, I want to get back to. Sweden and investing in Sweden because I'm always fascinated by investing in other countries because right? I'm, I'm not even familiar with investing in the UK. I left in 20, 2010 and I was not investing then. I had no idea. I knew you buy a house and you live in it, right? That's my, <laughs> that's my I you buy houses and rent it out. That's about the equivalent of what I understood. So I'm not familiar with that at all. And it's not very, um, I don't want to say 
popular but not very achievable in the UK to me because it, I don't know anyone that does it, you know? And right. I know here in the US, the average person in the US can buy an investment property, not easily, but it can be very much be done. So go, going back to Sweden, what you said that unless you have a ton of money there, you don't invest. So do, do people invest at all? Like what kind of, is it just the, the really the, the super wealthy that invest in real estate or do you have normal average Joes that invest in real estate there? Well, so the challenge in Sweden is the banks do not lend to you for, for real estate mm -hmm. because they'll look at your personal sal salary. So they would say, Barry, all right, you own your own home. Good for you. How, do you have enough salary to buy this other home? And you're like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to rent it out. And they're going to say, but what if you don't rent it out? And they're like, well, look, this is in Stockholm, right? You know, it will rent. There is a queue of like 2 million people, right? Everyone wants a home. And you're going to be like, so, so it's going to be fine. They're like, no, but you never know. Like, yes, you do know, but that's where your impasse is. They're like, no, if your salary can cover it, it's fine. Otherwise, no. So, so that that makes a challenge of you know being able to scale, and because you can't scale, scale because there are so few small investors, the kind of infrastructure that exists in the UK and in and in the US with you know your management agents, your well in the US you call them wholesalers, in the UK we call them sourcing agents, and and all these people they don't exist in Sweden. So if you're going to do it in Sweden, you got to figure it out on your own. You got to find your deals. So really the only type of investments that like most people will do, it's either simple flips because you can you can flip or they'll buy, you know, like in the few vacation spots that exist in Sweden, like Gotland where I've recently moved to, people come here in in like 6 weeks over the summer, we have a, you know, people come to Gotland. But for one of those weeks, especially, you can get a rent of four thousand dollars for that one week. So, so you can make that. So, so, so a lot of people living on the island or or wanting to invest will invest in kind of the ski resorts or here. But you're talking such a small number of properties. Then, when you get to the bigger deals, uh, we were looking at one today, and it's a very creative deal because it's like it's to throughout the the winter and fall and spring. You're renting it to students at a pretty good rate. And then those six weeks of the summer vacation, you kick all the students out because they're not there anyway, right? And then you rent it out for, for those six weeks, you make more money than you did for the rest of the year from the students. And that makes it a, you know, that, that deal was like, it's amazing. And we would still have a, only a 12% return on invested capital. Mm. So the only deal that really works in Sweden there is a law, if you, buy, if you build new and sell, there is a, a technique or a way that makes it incredibly profitable. So that's, and you have to build a big enough uh, development. So it has to be at least five properties. You probably want to be looking at at least 30 for this to really work. But what you do in Sweden, they don't have, when you own a flat in a building, you, you actually don't own your flat. You own a share of the entire building, and then you kind of have the right to live and right to use the inside of your apartment. So you're actually a co, co it's basically a co-op, the, the building. And so what you can do is if I build a, a new building, what I'll do is it will, say I spend, say $10 million to build this building. I would then sell the building for $10 million to individual buyers, but then the co-op would take a loan from the bank for maybe $5 million, which is now the co-op loan. They would give me those $5 million and that's my profit. Wow. So it's a completely different market, yeah. but that's, that's how you get around it is you kind of, you take on all this debt when building the property and then you give that over to the co-op and you keep your proceeds from the sale. Huh. So, so that's why you have to make bigger type projects to be able to be profitable here in Sweden. The smaller ones, the, the infrastructure isn't there. The systems aren't there. So it's, I mean, we do have people in our network that obviously do. And, and I always say it's a bit like, you know, if it, comparing it to the UK or the US, the markets are actually very similar. I'll say, I think it's, you moved in different circles of the UK and the US because it is very similar, but I kind of see it as if you're going to invest in Sweden it's as if you're going to a bar where they're like, no, you're not welcome. Do not come in. 
you somehow, you know, push the guy out of the way, fight your way in, you get in and everyone is looking down their nose at you. Like, <laughs> what is that trash doing here? You get to the bar and they're like, well, it's a hundred dollars a drink, have fun. <laughs> and you have this other bar on the other side of the street with this wonderful gentleman going, come on, come on in, free charge, no charge, come on in. You come in, free drinks, everyone loves you and it's a party. That's to me the UK. So I kind of always question, why would I fight to get into that Swedish bar the Swedish property market when I have this open market in the UK that is built for investing. Yeah, I like, I, that's a great analogy. That's a great analogy. And, and you can even like make that more, uh, you know, if we translate that to the US, right? There's markets here in the US that maybe people live like California, for example, that is a very difficult market to invest, right? Why yeah. fight that, right? Why fight that? Just because you feel like you need to be in your backyard, just because you feel like you need to um, touch that property, see that property, be able to visit it, right? You don't need to do that, right? There's systems and there's processes. Process well, in a market like the U.S., there there is a team that can handle it all. I mean, obviously, I screwed up the first time I used my team. <laughs> but once you learn how to do, if you get a mentor that's done that kind of distance investing, yeah, I, I mean, I ha there's a lot of my properties. Actually, I should say most of my properties I haven't even seen. Oh. But they're working, they're generating cash flow, and they're great property deals. And I've never once touched them. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But then, so then you, you went from Sweden where you said is this bar that's hard to get into, right? So this easy bar in the UK that everyone's welcoming and lets you in and it's cheap to drink or whatnot. <laughs> what, was that purely down to uh, a mentor that said, hey, UK is a good market? What, what made you go there? Or, or were you studying different markets all over Europe? Well, we, we're, uh, we're very analytical, actually, uh, me and my wife. So uh, we, we studied a bunch of markets. We've actually done deals in Spain as well. We did a, we did a, a, a study of uh, the Spanish market, and it turned out no one had any data in Spain. I mean, people are just basically running around going, yeah, it's going to be worth this or this. You're going to rent it for this. You know, no data. They're just buying and hoping for the best. Uh, so we actually sent two of our employees to, to Spain for a month. They came home for a month. They compiled all the data from like 40 different sources. And uh, our partner down there actually showed our reports to the banks. And, you know, two months from us saying we're doing Spain, they had our report on local TV going, this is the best property data in the entire South of Spain. <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there's different things in the markets, but we're very analytical that way. And the UK, what's great about the UK is, you know, it's not going to be like a Spanish market that goes up or goes down. You know, it's not, you know, some, some economies are a bit like, you know, the cryptocurrency of the property world, right? <laughs> they can go through the roof or they can drop, drop down. The UK is just slow, stable. It's there. It's the property market has been there for hundreds of years. It's going to be there for hundreds of years. And you're always going to make a profit if you do the deal right and you can hold it long enough. But at the same time, there are so many creative strategies. Almost everything you can do in the U.S., you can do in the UK. There are some tax lien strategies and stuff you guys can do in the US that we don't do in the UK. But you know, lease option, rent to rent, uh, seller financing, all those things you can do in the UK. So you can be just as creative. Plus, you don't have to worry about a lawsuit. We aren't as litig litigious in the UK as they are in the US. Yeah, that's for sure. That was definitely a learning lesson when I moved over here. That it's, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. definitely different in that aspect, right? And, but I think UK is getting more and more litigious, but still, still a long way behind the US. One yeah. thing I always uh, uh, I've seen t uh, shows on Netflix. I think it's called Buy Rent It something. It's on Netflix out here. I, I, I was I was addicted to it for a while. But it seems right. like the the tenant landlord laws are tough in the UK. Are they not? Well. I'm, I'm coming from Sweden, right? So okay. for me, I mean, in Sweden, there are market rent or there are regulated rents. You're not allowed to rent for, for anything. It's really hard to evict people, all that. For me, the UK is like a wonderland. It's market rents. It's easy to do my due diligence. If I, if I need to kick someone out, there's, you know, I can serve a 28 day notice and they have to get out. You know, it's very, very simple. And there's, there's such a good like eviction process. If someone isn't paying, you serve them, you know, the notice. If they don't move out in 28 days, you can talk to the courts and they'll send a bailiff to just throw the person out. And the great thing is all this is handled by the letting agent. So we don't even have to deal with it, right? So, so for me, it's brilliant, but I'm comparing to Sweden. Obviously, if you're comparing to the US, 
that might be even more free market. But but I'm I'm uh, for me, I've seen the UK has been fantastic. Oh, so so an eviction, how long would an eviction take? 28 days from start to finish? Well, 28 days is the technically like legal process, mm -hmm. but you know, if someone, you know, they have a 28 day notice, but as we know, as landlords, everyone doesn't obey the notice, right? So at that point, you go to court uh, and, and, you know, they, they will issue summons and stuff. And I believe that will take between two to two to three months. So usually it'll take about, you know, if someone's really, really doesn't want to get out, it'll take you somewhere three to six months. Uh, but that's that's a worst case. I've never, luckily, I've never been through that. And you know, we've had a few hundred tenants, so so luckily we haven't been through that. We've had we've had a few who've uh, run out. You know, they they didn't give notice and they just disappeared. And you know, we lost a few days' rent before we could get it out. We actually had a a drug dealer. It turned out in one of our properties, and, oh. and it was the police was closing in, and he disappeared, and we lost a few weeks' rent. But we. <laughs> We take that as a positive because I don't want to evict the drug dealer. That can be difficult. That would be messy. Yeah. I and mean, it's not yeah. Yeah. It my weeks. poor letting agent going in there. And going, Sir, <laughs> please move out. <laughs> and just, just to clarify, a letting agent is a property manager, right? Yeah. That's a management agent. Yeah. Sorry. That's, that's the British, uh, oh, yeah, British no, yeah. vernacular for yeah, you. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Yeah. And there's a, a flat uh, as well. A flat people have heard of the term flat is an apartment or a condo essentially. Just my dad would be so embarrassed like i said i'm american i'm born you know with an american accent and speaking but now i do business in the uk so i don't know i don't even speak the u.s terms it's property yeah. investment it's not even real estate to me <laughs> yeah and they're called estate agents right realtors are called estate agents you know, they're estate agents and you know yeah it's it's a completely different uh, different well i mean it's the british and american versions of english i guess yeah and correct me if i'm wrong the estate agents the realtors in in the uk they do the appraisals as well right so because it's no they actually oh. don't i mean a an estate agent in the UK, uh, an estate agency has to have certain licenses, but an estate agent basically just walks in there. You know, that they don't have to actually know anything. They'll often have a valuer in the office who has to have certain, certain uh, qualifications, but the ones who really do the, the, the proper valuations, the ones the banks care about, they are called surveyors. You want to have a RIC surveyor because that's the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, wow. and they do it all. And so, and you know, estate agents don't do any of the paperwork or anything as well. All that is handled by solicitors. Okay, okay. Shows you shows you how much I bought and, and invested in the UK. I have no <laughs> idea. It's just like I feel like I grew up in the US talking about <laughs> this. But uh, hey, you that's your property journey, yeah. right? It, yeah. it goes quite uh, like I mean, we're looking at deals here in Sweden, and I was talking to. Uh, one of the wealthiest men on, on Gotland, and we're, we're looking at doing a joint venture. And, uh, you know, he's like, well, I got this deal. Here's how it looks. And I, I had to ask the most stupid questions. I'm asking, like, so what kind of an interest rate do you get <laughs> yeah. here in Sweden, right? Because I put 4% in my calculator, because that's what we had in the UK. He's like, well, we could probably get 1.3. Like, oh, okay, let's change that. And wow. what loan to value? You know, I know zero, really. But uh, luckily, you know, the, this, this, this gentleman has done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of properties. So he's, he's kind of mentoring us through this, uh, you know, how do you do a deal in Sweden uh, as we are doing it in a joint venture. So it's been really, really fun. So, so the, uh, the interest rate there in Sweden on a loan is 1.3%? Yeah, well, at least now we're talking loans of about uh, $6 million. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you'll have, like, if you're a company borrowing money, Usually, it's about 6%. A private individual borrowing for a property is 1%. Okay. So a normal small deal would probably be somewhere in the middle, around the 4%. But someone like this gentleman who's, you know, millions and millions and millions and done so many deals, his, his loan will be about the same as a private individual buying their own home. What about a loan to value? Loan to value would be about, uh, well, it's based on their valuation, obviously, but about 75% okay. of their valuation. So in this case, we were looking at a property, their asking price, I'm just going to do a simple calling a dollar 10 krona. It's like 8.5 or whatever right now. But if it's 10, the deal is worth about $9.5 million. 
but the bank would only give us 75% of 80 because that's what they think it's worth. So, uh -huh. so essentially we would be getting 65 on this deal if we pay the asking price. Oh, wow. So, oh, so you, you, uh huh. So that they, what you pay for it and what they value, it's usually two different things. It, their value well, is usually much Yeah, it will that. depend. They'll usually do, and it's, I think it's the same in a lot of countries, you know, they'll value it, mm -hmm. you're buying it, and they'll take the lowest of the two will be the one they use. So if you're, you know, if you get a value of 10 million and you're buying at eight, well, they're just, they're giving you 75% of eight, right. right? But, and in our case, it's kind of the opposite. Now, obviously we, we put in a bid at 6 million and, and they said, no. <laughs> so, so we have some negotiation left to do. So we're hoping we might land at the, at the eight, if we do it at all. I mean, it's still in real, you know, it's, it's, we literally just started looking at it today. So, but, uh, but it's an exciting deal. Yeah, I love this. this is so interesting to me. Other countries, how they work, and then in the UK, what kind of interest rate are you looking at? What kind of LTV do you get there? Is it yeah, so ironically, now around the pandemic, you know, the the central bank obviously lowered the interest rates, yeah. but the moment they did, the interest rates for investors jumped by half a percent. Okay. So, so you know, that's just the lenders increasing their margin by a bit right there, uh, but I guess it's fair game. I mean, it's risk right now. So it used to be on a buy to let, you know, your regular rent to a, you know, family rental, um, you would get around 3.5%. But uh, now that's gone up to about 4%. Okay, still pretty, still pretty good. Here, here in the US, rates are really low. We're talking in the twos for someone who's buying home for them to live in. And even yeah, investment properties, cool. you might be able to get in the high twos, low threes. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, that works. That will work. Yeah. 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 We get 75% blending too. So, so that's, that's fine. They used to go up higher before 2008, 2009, but they've kind of scrapped that since the crash. So now we're working 75%. Interesting. And what, so what areas in, in the UK are you investing in and how did you pick those areas? Uh, we're really spread out to be oh. honest. And so I have, uh, I have a couple things in Manchester, some things north of Manchester. Uh, we have some flats up in Glasgow. Wow. Uh, we got a couple properties in Liverpool. Um, we've, we've done a lot of deals like around Birmingham, but we've actually sold all of that. Not because I don't like Birmingham. It's one of my favorite cities to invest in, but it just happened to end up with us selling those properties. Uh, we own a couple things in Kent, so that's outside of London. And then, of course, we have our golf resort in uh, the south of Wales. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, what and I shouldn't say we have. I was. We were the founding investors, so we're we're a small shareholder of a very, very big resort deal. You, you own some of the pie. That's all that matters, right? It's, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it's always fun to be able to say we were the founding investors because yeah. we, were the, we were the first ones <laughs> who saw the potential of his vision and said, "Yes, we're in. We're doing it." So, uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, I'll ask you a little bit more about that in a second. But I'm interested in what, what your business model is with all these other properties, like a lot of these flats, right? These condos or apartments that you're buying. What is your business model? Is it, do you buy them turnkey? Do you buy them that, that they need work? Do you, do you build them and do you rent them? Are you, are you flipping or, or does it all of the above? Well, so this is where my part gets a little fun because my specialty is raising finance. Mm -hmm. So my, my wife is the project manager. She does the due diligence. She kind of runs it while I work with raising finance. And so one of the big things that why people come to us or they listen to our podcast is that I've, we, well, I, but we've identified 25 sources of capital that you can use to fund a property deal. And that's for the deposit. So then you have the bank financing. So we got 25 ways you can fund your 25% deposit. And so I'm always looking at these different sources of capital. You know, they can be angel investors, JV partners. Uh, we've just uh, become partner in a crowdfunding platform now. So now that, that's one we're doing a lot with now. So we've started a new development company because that platform will fund up to 80% of the entire project. Wow. And I mean, purchase, refurb fees even the fee for using the platform <laughs> we can get 80 percent financing on and then we'll use that and the so depending on what source of capital we we have we're mm -hmm. looking at what type of deal works best so if i have you know certain jv partners i have a couple large i have a i'll take an example i have a jv partner who's he did an investment about 20 years ago and he's about to get paid out 
in the tens of millions of dollars into his bank account. And he just wants to put that with us in the UK to just, you know, he'll be free forever, right? We'll just, he doesn't need a 20% return. You know, if he gets five, he, he and his family and everyone else will be happy forever. So there we're just going to buy turnkey. We're going to buy already refurbed tenanted properties in good areas like city centers or at least in uh, key suburbs to cities where, where we'll have a good capital appreciation over time. So, so that's that source of capital. For the crowdfund, because that's kind of expensive money, it's 8% interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, what we, and it's short term, it's 18 month term. So what we want to do there is we're looking for a deal that we can get, that we can acquire with this capital, refurb, do it up, refinance it, pay off the loan, pull all of our money out. So it's a, you know, a no money deal. And then just sit with that property for, for a long period of time or flip it as a high yielding property. So those that we're mainly looking at like the Liverpool area where we can do in the UK, we call them HMOs. I don't know if you recognize the term. I've heard it, but I can't remember what it means. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you, you kind of notice them when living there, but I don't think anyone in the U S yeah. talks about it. It's when, you take, it's basically like a frat house or yes. for, for, for uh, my, ours are generally for professionals rather than students, but it's a co-op living, right? So you have a shared living, uh, a shared um, living room, shared kitchen, but then individual rooms. And we always try to put individual bathrooms in each room so that, you know, you don't have the morning log jam, right? <laughs> but, uh, but that, those have an incredible yield. They have an incredible yield because you'll buy a property right now. Actually, we're, we're in the final stages of negotiating a property in Liverpool. We're going to acquire it for 125,000. It's going to cost us about 55,000 to do up and refurb, but then the rent, it will be a six bed HMO. So we'll be renting out six rooms and then all of them will have their own bathrooms and then we'll have the shared, shared living room and kitchen. And let's just see, I think we're getting about 420 pounds per per month per room so that's about 500 dollars per room per month so it's about three thousand dollars per month of rent and we've we will have spent about two hundred thousand dollars to do the deal so the yield is is pretty insane i mean that's a whatever it is 20 percent yield or so um but uh, then of course there are costs there's a higher turnover you know and things like that but but those deals work very very well do you, so how do you have someone manage it? Are, are they are there um, uh, uh, property management companies that specialize in that type of thing? Because here, yeah, you yeah, a lot of them. So what what happens is we have essentially we have three types of uh, of lettings agents or management agents in the UK. Yeah. So you'll have your regular buy to let ones who say, you know, we we just do buy to lets. You know, we find you a tenant, we put them in there. And then no one hears anything from them for five years and they just pay their rent, right? That's, that's that basic model. The second ones are the ones who'll say, of course, we'll take your buy to lets, but we can also do your HMOs. And they'll charge a higher fee for those. They charge generally 10, 8 to 10% on a buy to let and 10 to 15% on an HMO of gross rents. And uh, then, you know, there's, it's a higher turnover. It's a little more work. But of course, the rent is much higher. And they're, they take a higher, higher percentage, so they make a lot more. And then you have the last group that basically doesn't touch any of the other two. Those are the ones who do your kind of short-term lets, your Airbnb-style properties, your holiday lets. And so for those properties, we rent out that way. That's who we then work with. <laughs> fascinating. This is so fascinating to me. Um, you said you guys are analytical, right? Have you, do you guys, have you guys analyzed every market there in terms of what you look for? Like, for example, here in the U.S., you look for job growth, population growth, job diversity, right? Um, those are the main things that you're kind of looking for. Is that kind of the same there in the U.K.? Yeah, well, I mean, we look at all these things uh, like crime rates and, mm -hmm. you know, as you say, the d diversity, the diversity in the area, you know, do they own, do they live, do they social housing, get that combination, you know, close to schools, hospitals, jobs, all these things. Uh, the difference between the UK and the US is that the US is huge, right? Yeah. I mean, the US is, it's so big. And if you choose the wrong town, it could become a ghost town in the future, right? The, the town employer moves and all of a sudden the town is empty uh, or even big city like Detroit, you know, right? Things can happen. 
in the UK, it's so small. It's just this little island. There's nowhere to go, right? So, so you know, there are good er there are good areas and worse areas, but you're not going to invest in a city that disappears. You can invest in a city, and then you know, I, I was very close to investing in a city uh, south of Hull. I'm not going to say it because anyone who's investing there will be mad at me for <laughs> calling them out. But south of Hull, there's a little fishing town, and I was right around going to invest there. And the deals, the numbers look brilliant. But that's because six months before, they Hull had opened up their new harbor. So all the fishing companies were moving to Hull and everyone was going unemployed. But that didn't show up yet in the stats because, you know, that there's a delay. So I thought the deal was great. But luckily, one of my mentors stepped in and said, no, 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 no. You're not buying this. Let's go back to Hull and look because everyone's moving. But that city's still there. It's had huge, you know, since then, it's had regeneration. So it's not back to pre-levels, yeah. but it's not gone. And it's kind, kind of coming back, kind of like Detroit, right? It's, it, Detroit was too big a city to fail. And it's kind of the same with, with, with uh, you know, the UK. It's too small an island to, for something to fail. So uh, we look much more, you know, I'm not very hard on like, I won't invest in Liverpool, but there are certain areas of Liverpool I wouldn't invest in, while there are other areas of Liverpool where I'd love to invest in. Yeah. And so any city that's got at least 300,000 people living in it, I'm fine with, as long as I'm investing in the right parts of that city. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah interesting. Yeah, there's definitely parts of Liverpool that I wouldn't, wouldn't invest. But Liverpool, yeah, exactly. I love Liverpool. That's my soccer team, Liverpool, so football team. So <laughs> I, I, I would definitely invest there myself. Um, I, I want to go back to the raising capital. As you said, that's your, 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 you know, your, that's your skill set, right? That's what you, yeah. you mainly focus on. Starting out, right? You, you invested, you, you talked a little bit about stuff that went wrong, but starting out, how were you able to um, raise all that capital? Because when you don't have a track record, right? Even though if you have education, you have knowledge, with all that track record and stuff, it's a lot harder. So how were you able to raise that money initially? Yeah, I mean, this is something we're working with our students on all the time. And I made so many mistakes. I mean, I started out as, you know, I kind of ran around like your typical, like first time MLM person who runs around calling all their friends, telling them to buy their products, right? And then after a while, no one returns their calls anymore. <laughs> so that was kind of me. I mean, I was beating at these doors every single day. And, you know, finally people took pity on me. Uh, <laughs> but, but really what turned things around was, uh, I, I still remember it because I was sitting in the office. I remember it was, I think it was a Thursday afternoon. I'm talking to my colleague and I'm going like, hey, dude, we're just doing this first property deal. I'm so excited. We, you know, the legals are going through this. Is so, so amazing. And, you know, he's like, yeah, whatever, Daniel, do, do your thing, whatever. And then I got home and I was like, man, I got to do something. And I wasn't really thinking about him, but I was, you know what? I think it's time to show people that we're actually property investors. And I posted a couple pictures of it on Facebook. And I said, hey, our first deal is going through. I'm super excited. Next morning in the office, I'm there at 8, 8 a.m., 8.15, he comes in, and I, I'm sitting here, and he's walking in behind me, so I have no idea that he's here. All of a sudden, he's right here. He's like, Daniel, I'm like, what? He's like, it's for real. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're actually a property investor. Yes, I know. He's like, no, but I saw it on the internet. I know I posted it. He's like, yes, but it's for real. I'm like, I've been telling, telling you for three months. He's like, yes, but now it's on the internet. I'm like, dude, it's on Facebook. It's my Facebook. I can post whatever I want. But that was for real for him. All of a sudden, it was for real because he could see it. And, and that's something we work with a lot of our students on now. And, and actually, I had a guest who's so much better at this than I am on the Momentum Investing podcast a couple of weeks ago called Ben Chai. And we went through like his posting system for it. He's raised, I mean, literally when he came on the show, he was saying, and you know, he's, a, he's such a funny guy and he's so modest. So this is going to sound bad, but he is a wonderful, modest guy. But he was complaining that he had three million pounds, too much money to invest. He wasn't <laughs> able, he found deals, you know, all the deals he could find, he'd finance them. And people were going, we want more, we want to give you money. And so I had him go through on the show how we had done it. And we use this for our students and we show them how to kind of document their journey and share this, the journey, the challenges, the setbacks, but also just like, you know, the small wins. I started my first company. 
I'm there. I had a meeting with the sourcing agent. I had a meeting with my mentor. I did this, I did that. You know, this is my team and all these kind of posts that will allow people to see like, wait a sec, this is for real. You're actually serious. You're doing this. It's not just something that, you know, you're talking about over a beer. You're, you're actually doing it. And again, for some reason, when it's online, people take it seriously when they can see it, even though it's your own Facebook wall. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's true, right? It's true. And it's, like you said, you can be talking about it all the one, but I think it's that proof. When, once you show that you're doing it, you show pictures and people hear about how well your deal, deal is doing, people you know, want to be involved. I think a lot of people want to be involved in real estate. They're either scared or they don't think they can do it or whatever. So if they have someone else that they hear that's doing it, that's being successful, I think they want to be involved with our people. With those yeah, people. I mean, I think I usually tell our students that you know, you'll have three reactions when you tell them what you're doing. So the worst reaction you can possibly get is that they don't react at all, right? They're like, you know, you tell them like, hey, dude, I'm going to get into property investing. I'm like, oh, cool. Did you catch the game last night? <laughs> right? had no, no impact. You know, this person, is, you know, they have no interest in property. They're never going to invest with you. But then I tell my students, like the second worst reaction you're going to get is when they get really excited. They're like, oh, my God, that's so cool. I've always wanted to do that. And my students always go like, why is that a bad reaction? I said, well, that's, they're going to ask you for my details and they're going to come and be my student. They're never going to give you their money, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they're so excited and passionate that they don't want to give you their money. They want to do it themselves and they want to learn. So the best reaction you can get when you tell someone, oh yeah, I'm in real estate is when they go, oh my God, you idiot. Don't you know the market's going to crash or this is wrong or that? And they give you this tirade of all their fears that is the best possible reaction you can get is what, what I did. And I actually did this with, with my parents is because they thought I was an idiot. I, <laughs> right? Because, you know, they saw me, you know, I read this book. I said, I want to do property. I went to a workshop that I paid for. I paid, you know, a thousand dollars to go to a workshop. Like, You're you idiot. Why would you give that money? I go to this workshop and then I pay another, you know, $20,000 for a mentorship and they're like, you buy everything. What's wrong with you? And then when I go out, you know, I'm going to do a property deal. They expect me to just take the first deal that comes on my desk and I'm going to lose everything. Yeah. And I did happen to lose everything, but not because I took the first deal. <laughs> but so what I did over a period of time was every time I would meet my parents, I would share with them, you know, like, hey, they would be like, you know, they would always like, so how's the property investing going? You know, that really yeah. derogatory, like negative. And I would always be like, oh man, it's so challenging. We got five deals this week and they looked so good. But let me tell you about them. The first one, we did the due diligence. We saw that, you know, they'd expected an end value of 60,000. We saw it was only going to be 50 and the deal didn't work. So we had to say no to this one. This one, the rent was lower. This one was in an area we didn't want to invest in. This one, well, it was just not good enough. And this one, you know, there was, and then this one was so close. But when they went, did the survey, they found, you know, Japanese knotweed in the bar, in the back, in, in, in the back garden, which means we can't get lending. So we can't do the deal. And every time I met her, I met my parents, it was especially my mother, she would ask, well, how's it going? And I would go on this tirade of how, how we're saying no to deal after deal after deal. And we did this for about three months. And, you know, we, and this was the time it took to do a deal. And, you know, finally, you know, I came in, she's like, so how's it going? And I'm like, oh man, I got to tell you, we said no to these deals. And she went, you got to start saying yes sometime. <laughs> I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Say, well, you can't, you spent all this money on your education. Just buy something for God's sake. You got to lower your standards. And she, that she went from thinking me this idiot who will buy anything to this perfectionist who will only take the perfect deal. And then when we did come and say, we bought a deal, she was the one who popped the champagne. And a couple months later, she invested for the first time with us. So, so, you know, some people, when they are that negative, some people go pretty quick to turn. I have one, it's taken like six years and he's just about to invest with us now. And, and, you know, my mom, it took about six months, but, but it's that allowing them to have that negative reaction and proving to them that I'm doing the work, right? I've, I've got a proper accountant. I got a proper team. I'm doing the due diligence. I'm learning. I'm educating myself. That's how you slowly turn people to your side you don't necessarily have to do a deal to get them on board. You just have, 
have to prove that you know what you're doing. And I love selling other people than myself. So if I, you know, if I go to you and say, Barry, I want you to invest with me because I'm the best investor you've ever seen. This is going to go so well. You're kind of going to go like, you know what? Maybe I'm going to find someone who's a little more humble. But if I go, hey, Barry, I am so lucky. I have this amazing team that we've put together here in the UK. Let me tell you about them. They're this, this, this. I am so blessed to work with them. And you know what? I would like to invite you to join us and join this amazing team on a deal. What do you say? Would you like to be a part of it? You're like, yeah, I might want to because I'm not t- saying I'm good. I'm saying they're good. Yeah. And I can always tell you how fantastic someone else is. And I'm just blessed to be working with them. And I can sell them as much as I want. But if I start telling you how good I am, you know, that's when the warning flags, you know, the, the used car salesman kind of triggers come up. And you go like, nah, nah, how about we don't do business? Yeah, that's interesting. So, so, you're, you're, so with these people that says, hey, real estate's for idiots. You're going to lose all your money. Your ploy then is with these people to get in front of them and talk to, to them, tell them how conservative you are, how, how you analyze deals thoroughly. And so but with your mom, that's easy, right? Because you're going to talk to her anyway and you open her up to it. But to someone that you don't really know, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, so there are a couple of ways you can break them down. I mean, somehow that conversation came up, right? So you're meeting them somehow. So there are a couple ways you can break it down. The first thing, though, is you have to show them that they've been listened to and understood. Mm. Because if, they don't, if you don't hear them, they will never hear you. So I always tell our students, if nothing else, just say, thank you so much for your concerns. I really appreciate it, and I'll take it under advisement. You don't have to go down the rabbit hole and definitely don't get defensive. Just say, thank you so much for that. Let them, you know, let them throw all that negative energy at you. Let it rinse off you and just say, look, I respect your opinion. I think you're right in a lot of it, and I'm going to keep it under advisement. I appreciate it. So that just disarms them a little bit. But then what's going to happen is, so again, there are two ways mainly I use to break them down. One is if you met them somewhere, you're probably going to meet them again. And if this person has, you know, if they had that negative reaction, it's going to be eating at them. You've planted a seed. They're going to be thinking about this. Like Barry's, Barry's investing in property. What, what an idiot. Why would he do that? And probably somewhere in their mind, they're going, I wish I was brave enough. <laughs> but, but, you know, that somewhere that's going to be, but it's this planting mind. So every time you meet them, they're probably going to bring up the property investing or they're waiting for you to do it. Mm. And they're, every time they're going to have a new negative reaction. But that's just until they get it all out. What I then try to do simultaneously, that's where the social media comes in, because that's a way, and you know, people, co- people you know, communicate through complaining, right? So when you're with someone and they start complaining about how horrible the property market is, join them, but join them in a way where you show them how good you are at it, right? Where you're going like, yeah, man, it is so hard to find a deal. Exactly. I mean, I think we might have a crash now. I mean, the pandemic has thrown the economy into trash. So when I'm buying a deal, I can't just buy a good deal. I need a deal that can be good, even if the market falls by 20%. It is so hard to find. But you know what? I'm not giving up. Like, dude, you should just give up. It's not going to work. I know, I know. But you know what? I've been lucky to find these teams that they're super expensive. Yeah, but you're probably going to get ripped off by teams. I know. Yeah, that's why I've hired this lawyer who takes care of all that and makes sure that everything is ironclad because it's so dangerous. Because you know how horrible people can be. And then you go into bitching as well. But you're always saying like, yes, I know. I understand what you're saying. I put the safeguard in place. But it's so horrible that I have to put the safeguard in place. People suck but I've done it. They're like, wow. Okay. So he's thought of that too. And you're kind of overcoming it. And then at the same time, you're posting on social media going like, well, we're doing this. I'm doing this. I have this meeting. I have this meeting. And that just gives them, it it proves that you're serious. It proves that you know what you're doing, but it also just reminds them that you're there. It keeps, it's like, you know, it's like the, the story of the, uh, the frog that's gets, if you drop a frog in boiling water, it leaps out. Right. But if you, try, if you put it in cold water and slowly raise the temperature, it, it sits there till it boils. I don't know if it's true, but it's a good story. <laughs> uh, the same thing goes for investors. But I do think you want to kind of dunk them in there once, you know, give them that shock. I'm a property investor. Let them have that reaction and then just let it go at a slow boil from there. And then different people will go different fast. You'll notice it 
by the way they have their negative reaction, right? They'll, they might have a big first reaction. They might have a lower second one. Then they might come back and have a real big one again, because, you know, what will happen is, you know, they'll feel their, their, you know, their, their own barriers breaking down and they're catching themselves more often going like, wow, I really want to invest with Barry. That would be so cool. And then they'll be really afraid. So the next time they meet you, they're going to go all in to try to get you to convince them not to do it. And again, you just respect them. You take it. You show them the safeguards while, you know, commiserating with them, you know, complaining together, but showing them how you've overcome it. And the fact that you only buy the very, very best. And those deals are so hard to find because that also seeds the day you bring them a deal, they know this is going to be the best deal there ever has been in the market, right? Because they know how discerning you are. And then you have the social media going in the background, showing that you are serious, that you're good, that you're doing this. And finally, their reaction, it will stop being the, well, what are you doing now? To being more, hey, Barry, tell me something. What are you doing right now? Have you done any deals lately? And then they want to, you know, then they're interested. And that's the point when you can start using other ways to kind of like, yeah, you know what? I got this deal. I'm about to show it to this investor. But dude, I would love to get your feedback. Would you be okay taking a little look and seeing if you think this is a good deal before I offer it to them? Like, yeah, sure, of course I will. And this is one of my guests, Justin Whitmore, I had on the show. He, I shouldn't take credit for this because it's straight up him. But it's so good because then they'll look at it and they have no, their, their defense isn't up because they're, they're giving you their feedback and they're to- looking for someone else. And they'll look at it. And if you show them a really good deal now, they'll be like, yeah, Barry, this, this looks really good. Could I get in on this maybe? <laughs> You're like, oh man, sorry. I've already promised it to them. And you know, integrity is everything for me. So that's their deal. But you know what? If I find a similar deal, would you like me to come with it to you? Like, yeah, yeah, let's have a conversation. Well, now you're going to find another deal in the next couple of weeks. Bring it to them and say, good news, my man. We're in business. So, so you use this. It's that process of slowly getting them ready. And like I said, some people will just be ready to throw themselves in. And, uh, you know, if they're willing to invest with you, you take it. But my experience is they, those people generally want to go and do it themselves. And that's why I tell my students, like, well, they're going to be calling momentum property education and you're going to miss out. So you want the negative reactions. Mm. So the, those first two reactions, you just kind of let them be and just focus in on the guy the, for the most part. The, guy, the ones. Yeah, that- I mean, I mean, if someone's super excited, obviously, you know, obviously they might invest with you or they'll do their own thing. And if nothing else, you might have a JV partner or maybe a future sourcing agent or, you know, a wholesaler or whatever, that could be a partnership or just someone like, Hey, we're in the same industry. Let's be friends. Uh, but those who have zero reaction, yeah, just complete, you know, if, if you tell someone I'm doing it because being a property investor, that's a big deal. It's not like saying I invest in stocks, right? That like, yeah, so does me, my brother, my aunt and my cousin, right? Everyone does that. But saying I'm a property investor, that's a big deal. That's weird. That's different. So they should react. If they don't react, they just don't care at all. And you could beat your head against that for for decades and you'd never get them to invest. So just ignore them. Talk about the game. They can be your friends, but they're never going to be your investors. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Qu- uh, quickly talk about, um, because we're running out of time, quickly talk about that golf deal in Wales, the, the golf <laughs> course deal. <laughs> How did that come about? How- what, what is you guys' involvement? What, what does oh, that yeah, mean? that was so cool. It was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, well, the, what happened was for me, I had just raised money for my first two big de- developments. So I'd raised about 380,000 pounds for one deal. I'd then raised a million pounds for another deal. So I was kind of flying high at this point. And then my mentor comes to me and says, hey, would you like to get involved in this? I'm like, well, tell me. You know, I'm like, I can raise money for anything. You know, so I was confident, overly so it turned out. But, but he came to me with this deal and he had acquired, it was an 18-hole golf course that was, uh, so it was a group of owners that, that had it, but they'd rented it out to a golf pro and his business partner. And uh, I'm not sure, I don't know the whole story, but I believe the business partner had kind of disappeared or for God's sake, he, he was out of the picture. And the golf pro, he knew golf, he didn't know anything about business. So the, the golf resort went bankrupt. And now a golf course, if it's not manicured perfectly, 
it goes wrong quickly. I mean, you need to have someone there manicuring it every single day, otherwise it falls apart. And so the buildings, they were kind of old and they were kind of, they, they were in bad shape, you know, like the clubhouse and stuff like that, the reception area. Now the golf course was falling apart and this ownership group was just like, we, we got to do something. We got to get rid of this. And so my mentor went in and he got it on a lease option for a really good price. And he's put in, uh, he needed to put in a small deposit. So I raised that money first and we put in the deposit. And, uh, and I got, you know, I got to come in at a really good, uh, at a good uh, uh, valuation. And because the reason why I just jumped on it right away was that he saw that you could do so much more than just run an 18 hole golf resort. I mean, South Wales is beautiful. You know that better than me, of course. I've never even been, I just seen pictures, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, it's beautiful, right? I mean, and this is, you know, uh, this golf resort, it's, it's in an area called Raglan. And so to like the Southeast, there are these lakes that like people come and they'll fish and it's just beautiful, you know, beautiful, huge lakes. And on the other side to like the Northwest, there are these mountains or hit well in Wales, I guess you would call them hills because you guys got real mountains, but for the rest of the world, they are small mountains and there are these gorgeous hiking trails. So it's this like wonderful, like touristy kind of place. And then in the middle of this, you have this golf resort. And he said, saw that there was so much you could do with it. You know, you could, uh, and, and he saw that we could remake it into a whole resort. And so we remade it. We, we obviously remake the, the 18 hole. We actually rebuilt it into a, uh, into a nine hole. And the reason a lot of golf resorts are doing this now, because people generally don't have time to do a full 18 hole circuit. They'll either play the nine hole twice, or they'll just do a nine hole. And it's cheaper and it doesn't take the whole day. So we're remaking it to a nine hole. We've already remade it to a nine hole. That frees up massive amounts of land. I mean, nine holes on a golf resort, that is so much land. So we're then we're now building these like steel framed cottages. And we're gonna have about, I think we're gonna have about 75 of them in there that we'll be able to rent out and get, you know, just an incredible turnover from. But then also the, the, the clubhouse, it's this huge building. So we have, you know, we have a reception, we got a restaurant, we got a cafe, but we're also now building a spa, uh, a gym, a, and then this a whole conference area. So the, our big thing is, you know, the summer season isn't going to be hard. It's a tourist area and it's a golf resort, right? So we're going to be fully booked because it's just a really classy resort. But then the problem for most golf resorts is, well, six to nine months out of the year you don't have anyone there and so that's where we have because we're both in the event industry he's a business consultant he works with some of the largest companies in the uk we run events and he we obviously know pretty much everyone in europe that does events so we we're building this conference center so everyone will be able to do retreats and around the retreat there is I mean, they're building such incredible things. There's going to be like over one of the lakes, there's going to be this like rope, whatever kind of adventure thing that's like perfect for team building. Uh, there's this Japanese garden that's out there. There's, I, I mean, they've, they've basically sat down with every event company and said, what would make the perfect event place? And, you know, we're going to have fire walk and glass walk and like martial arts areas, like all these things that anyone would want for an event. So that will allow us to then fill it during the winter. And then of course, we're, we're building more stuff as well because we want it to cater to kids. So we have some woods as well. And in the wooded areas, we're gonna be able to build like these super tree houses. I mean, tree houses that cost $150,000 to build that have like slides down to the ground. It's like, th think of Peter Pan village kind of thing that we're gonna be building one of those. And you know, essentially you'll get 150,000 of annual rents from one of these. You cost 150, year one, you make it back. We're gonna build 10 of these. And, and then we're looking at even building a water theme park. Wow. So that will be when the kids really come in and you know we might have, I mean, there's just so much room so we could do so much. And so we're gonna have, you know, we're, we'll have different seasons. We'll have the, 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 you know, the golf people, we'll have the kids and the family travel, and then we'll have the, uh, the conference people coming in so we're we're actually going to probably make more money in the off season than we do in the in the high season because of the conference side 
Wow, sounds like an absolutely amazing project. I'll you'll have to uh, s send me some details. I want to check it. Check yeah, I'll send I'll send you a link to the website uh, afterwards so you can take a look. They've they've done really well with it. And like I said, we're just we're the we're the founding investors. So I have meetings. I, I mean, we know people, so I refer people into the project. So the gym is the gym we're probably going to have is someone I know. So we're bringing in. But uh, but there he's running the whole thing. He's done such a brilliant job. I'm just proud that I saw the gem he had before he did. So I invested. Oh, I got such a low valuation. It's ridiculous. I mean, just <laughs> after about 12 months into the project, he he put it out on. We we used a crowd fund to raise, or he used a crowd fund to raise more money, and it was at five times my valuation that I'd invested in. So it was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, you'll, it seems like you'll do all right on that deal. Yeah, I'm happy about it. <laughs> well, as this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate, I'd like to incorporate some wrestling-related real estate questions. <laughs> so the first question is, what what would your wrestling name be if you picked one for yourself? So I, I would be the ridiculous wrestler, I think. My nickname would be Woody. So from Toy Story, because I'm Daniel Wood, so I've always been Woody wherever I am. So I guess I would be there with a cowboy and try to talk like Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Um, every wrestler has a special move. What is your special move in real estate? Well, that's the raising finance. I mean, the, the, my ability, my special skill, my special power is, is the ability to find money and then pair it with deals. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of, I always say it's like putting down a puzzle. So you find the, you know, you have a deal, you find the right type of money or you have the money, you find the right type of deal and putting that together. That's, that's where I go crazy. Very cool. Um, what's been the biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate investing career? Well, that was when we started out and that was, it wasn't just one. It was like five guys jumping on us one at a time. Um, and it really, it was such a tough because it was the first deals we did. And that's why it was so very, very tough. You know, we bought, we bought a couple small flats in Scotland that went okay, but then we did a larger development in near Manchester. We ended up losing about $120,000. We then did some more deals that we did a, a lease option that we ended up losing about $100,000 on. Uh, yeah, it wasn't fun. And, and we had multiple other deals that we sold that, you know, we, we were forced to sell to pay back investors. And we took, you know, 20,000 there, 30,000 there. And then the kind of, thing that capped it all for us that the last big guy who jumped on the pile was when the brexit vote went through and um, we the pound fell and we owed people in swedish krona a few weeks later and we lost a hundred thousand dollars well a hundred thousand pounds so about one hundred thirty thousand dollars right there when the vote happened Wow. So, so yeah, it was, it was a bunch. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you're still here, right? You're still, and you're still doing it. So. Yeah. No, we've had so much help. I mean, when Kim came in, when Derry supported us, uh, Arnon, I mean, so many have supported us there. They helped us really just compensate by doing a lot more good deals, restructuring debt, selling bad properties, refining good ones. And we were able to slowly turn things around. So uh, we've had a lot of help. So was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope getting ready to jump, but you were too scared. What was it and how did you overcome it? Well, <laughs> my, my problem isn't really that I don't jump. My problem is that I jump and don't always look. So the guy's not lying there on the mat and I just, <laughs> I just slam into the ground, uh, you know, belly first. Um, so I think that's what I've kind of learned going forward is because like I said, we jumped both feet first into property. We just said, this is what our mentor taught us. We're going to use the system right off and it's going to go perfectly. And we didn't really look into it. We didn't go deeper. You know, people were referred for, I mean, we got referrals from everyone. So we had to learn how to project manage, how to do the due diligence, how to put together the right team. And, and that it's taken a lot of time to kind of get that. But now that we have, we, we are a lot more discerning and, and I've learned to make sure if I'm going to do a body slam, you know, if I'm going to jump from the rope, I got to know that the guy's there and he's not going to move. But by, by the time I get to the ground, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be said there as well, right. It's about taking action and moving forward. Right. It's like, cause it's easy to get caught in that analysis paralysis and not, never end up doing anything. Right. Yeah, I know a lot of people do, and, and I'm, I'm the extreme in the other way. So I'm, I'm, the kind, I'm that warning that they point to to justify not taking action. <laughs> um, but, but again, I think if you put yourself out there, I think you'll meet these amazing people like I met Kim Kiyosaki and, and all these others 
who came in and really said, look, you can do it. It's possible. And they did help us. They did help us restructuring. But the big thing was they just looked us in the eye and said, look, you're awesome. You can do this. And we said, well, if you say so, I guess we will. <laughs> and then we figured it out. And, and I think that vote of confidence is so huge. And, and uh, I think if you put yourself out there and you take action, you're going to meet someone that will give you that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, thank you so much, man, for, for, for doing this interview and for taking the time all the way from, from Sweden. You know, it's a, a fascinating story that you have. Really, really so interesting. Investing in the UK from Sweden and just everything that you guys have done, investing in a golf course and teaching and, you know, teaching other people how to invest, the, uh, to raise capital. It's, it's really cool, man. So I appreciate all of that. But before we go, um, where can people find out more about you? And if they want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Well, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. I, I've, uh, you know, we've been friends for a while on Instagram and it was like, yeah, I want to still want to be on the show. So I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone taking the time listening to my ramblings. <laughs> uh, if you want to listen more, I think, uh, I mean, our podcast, the Momentum Investing Podcast is a great resource. I interview some brilliant people. They're a lot smarter than I am. Uh, who uh, who can really give some good advice. So for example, there, if you want to know how we post on social media, we got a great episode with Ben Chai that's, that's on there. Uh, I got an episode with Kim. I've done an episode with Jordan Harbinger where he talked about networking. It was brilliant. So that, that's really a key resource. Otherwise, I would really recommend just connect with us on social media. You can find Momentum Property Education on Instagram, on Twitter, on Thursday, I'm going to get the new clubhouse. So uh, excited about that. And then our, where I am most active, like personally. So if you want to watch videos from me, like every single day, um, I guess you'd get tired of me at some point, but you know, <laughs> for now, we have a group on Facebook called the International Property Investors. So you can find it either by going to our Facebook page, Momentum Property Education, it's linked, or you can just search for it. You should find it. There's a picture of me, Giselle and Lukas, uh, and you can join the group. Uh, you know, answer the questions, I'll accept you in. And that's a great community, over 1,300 property investors from all over the world. We got US, we got Africa, we got Europe, we got Asia, we got Australia, South America, everywhere, communicating, working together, finding ways, sharing their deals, asking questions, supporting each other. So that's been a brilliant community. Wow. Yeah, very cool, very cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join that group myself. I, I really yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. You got well, it. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much, man, for making the time. It was really inter really interesting and fascinating interview. I, lo I loved all of that. So appreciate you sharing and uh, enjoy the rest of your day there in uh, Sweden, man. I'm sure it's getting late there, I think. Yeah, it's about 20 past 10, so it's time for bed. But thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, my man. My pleasure, man, my pleasure.